uh, we live in, a, in an extremely interesting time uh, right now uh, between the challenge of COVID and the challenge of people's fears and their mindsets. Uh, I look at uh, around me, I look at my practice and, and I see my patients and my family and my friends. And I feel there's a part of me that feels that I failed in my mission. Uh, there's a part of me that really feels as though this idea that I had that I was going to change the world and how people saw the world, um, that I was going to fail, that I failed because people are running away from this virus. People are masking and wanting to not be with family, are allowing their, 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 uh, their aging parents to, to die in loneliness and by themselves. And there's a part of me that, that sits with that and says, we, we really messed up. And, and as I look at it, I said, did I really fail? And I feel as though that the, the, the challenges that are before you, the generation, because you're, you're, you're carrying the torch behind me. You know, I've been carrying the torch for 38 years and trying to bring this idea to the world. But I look at you and your vitality and your youth and your vision. And part of me says, you guys are going to be carrying the torch behind me. And I've, I've always felt as though I'm going to carry it as long as I can, because I know that, that we have the axles and then the people behind me that are going to carry it beyond that. And I really feel as though sometimes the, the, the challenges that face you, that face me right now are insurmountable, that, that it's something that, 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 that has gone too far. And then I saw an interesting quote, and which I'd like to read. And it says, though the problems of the world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. And as I read the quote, and I really sat with that, I realized that the concept and the idea that we get attached to as chiropractors is extremely simple. That our philosophy, how we practice, the idea of what we do, and even the application of our art is extremely simple. But yet its impact into people's lives is increasingly profound. Something I've realized in practice that, that every time that there has been a challenge in my life, that there's been a concern or a worry, that the universe has always presented me very graciously a perspective or an answer. So yesterday, as I'm thinking about preparing and speaking to you, and I'm serving my patients, and I want to hold the space for you of this incredible vision that we have. There's a woman who came in, and I adjusted her, and we had a little conversation afterwards. And she turned to me, and she said, she's only been under care about a, a month, and about 33, 34 years old. And she came in because her back bothered her. And uh, as we educated her and her understand that it's a lot more than dealing with back pain. And we'll talk about that in a minute. She stopped me in the process of our conversation. She said, Dr. Peter, you don't realize. You and your practice has changed my life. And I said, really? She says, yeah, my pain went away, but you've changed my life. I feel as though I can be me again. That I can be me as a person, as a mom, as a wife. I can be me again. And I can be true to what I need. Well, at that point, I had tears in my eyes as she walked out of the room and I said, wow. And this is a woman who, when she came in, was double masked, wearing gloves, now gets on the table without anything. And realizing that what we did and, and the ideas that we began to impart upon her transformed not only her life, but that of her family. So my goal today is to... Uh, talk to you guys as you're all students yes you're all students at bcc which is one of the finest chiropractic colleges in the world right i've been there i love your school i love your leadership uh and i i'm so excited to be able to do this so first i want to talk about what i believe you need to do now for success within your life okay so so, so you, you some really simple things and as i said they're simple. There's nothing that I'm going to say. You're not going to get off this call and say, oh, my God, that was profound. It, it, it's going to be really simple. 
Uh, secondly, I want to give you uh, some really simple tools of how you can be excited every day. Now, I know you already are. Students are. But just how to stay in that state of excitement every day while you're in school, but more importantly, when you're in practice. And then how to keep your passion for chiropractic and service alive. So uh, first, uh, most of you don't know me. Uh, I'm 64 years old, which is so bizarre to say that uh, because I used to look at people who were six, in their 60s and I said, oh, my God, they're old timers. Right. Uh, and and, and, and I, I remember being a student. I said, I want to be an old timer someday. Yeah, I, I want to feel like I know, you know, I, I, I like I own it. Uh, now that I am in that position, I'm the old timer. I'm going to tell you something. I make it up every day. OK, yeah, it, it, it is a continuous journey of learning and recreating and being bathed in this beautiful idea, this beautiful philosophy that we have. So I am more excited today to be in practice than I was when I started uh, 38 years ago. Uh, I'm more passionate to serve my patients than I've ever been, even through this whole craziness of COVID. And I'm more intrigued every day to learn more. And the universe will give you that. So uh, I practice in Massachusetts, Westwood, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Boston, about 30 minutes. Uh, it's a family practice. We see lots and lots of families, lots of babies, uh, lots of pregnant ladies. Uh, how busy is the practice? We serve in the office about 200 to 275 people in a day. That's the typical volume that, that we see. About 30% of the practice is children. Uh, about 80% of the practice is outside their first year of care. So 80% of the people I serve in the day have I've seen for at least a year, probably more. And we have uh, right around just under actually 200 people that have been under care in the practice for over 20 years. So for over 20 years, they've, I've had nearly 200 people walk through the front door of my practice once a week or more because regular care in my office is getting your spine checked and adjusted as needed once a week. So that's the, the, that's the snapshot of my practice. Uh, it, I practice in my home. It's a home practice and if, uh, um, I, I don't need to show you the picture, but it's uh, um, a, a large house. The, my house has, I think, four bedrooms in it. The office is about in square footage, about 1,800 square feet. So it's a good size building. Uh, I practice with my wife, Patty Giuliano. We've been in practice together most of that time. Uh, I've always been full-time in the practice. Patty has over the last few years uh, uh, stepped out of the practice. She stepped out of the practice, obviously, when we had kids. We have two children. My children now are 32 and 34 years old, which is the age of you guys, which is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it has it confirms in the fact that I'm an old timer. Um, neither of them are chiropractors, but they were both born at home. We were, they were born here. We raised them in a very vitalistic model of, of ideals uh, in our practice, but we always worked in our home. Uh, right now, Patty has uh, she stepped out of the practice when we had the kids for a period of time, but more recently has stepped out. She's semi-retired. She only works one day a week. I work the practice full time. I went to Palmer College. I graduated in 1982. Uh, Patty graduated the same year from Life University. We didn't meet until we were both graduated and in practice. Uh, she had started her own practice in downtown Boston. I associated in a practice outside of Boston. We have met each other, fell in love, and then started our own home practice uh, about a year and a half after that. And since then, we've been practicing together. Before I went to chiropractic school, I was a civil engineer. I went to engineering school. I was very drawn to math and science. I love the, the logic and the analytical sides of that. And when I went to chiropractic school, uh, and that, that's a whole story, what drove me to chiropractic school, which we can, I, I can tell you if you, you want when we do the questions. But when I wound up in chiropractic school and the diversity of different perspectives in terms of technique, I was drawn very much to the mechanical orientation of subluxation analysis and correction. So I was very connected to Gonstead with the lines and the angles and, and Pettibon and Harrison's work. And when I graduated school, I was very, very much an upper cervical practitioner. I spent most of my time in the clinic or the health center practicing uh, NUCA technique. NUCA was a technique, an upper cervical technique that evolved from Grostic technique, which evolved from BJ Palmer upper cervical. 
So that was my, my uh, orientation when I was in chiropractic school. My mentors when I was in school, I watched loads and loads of videos of BJ. I uh, listened to most of his lectures, uh, mostly by audio. There were a few videos of him. Uh, I had met Reggie Gold. Uh, Reggie Gold was a huge mentor of mine. I listened to all of his stuff and read much of his work. Uh, Reggie became a good friend of mine as I got into practice. And I know him and Irene very well until Reggie passed. Uh, Joe Felicia was a huge mentor of mine. He worked with Guy Reekman a number of years and they developed a patient education program. Uh, another huge influence uh, over me was Tom, Dr. Tom Gilardi, the fellow who started Sherman College. Uh, he and a number of instructors from the school came up and did a few philosophy programs at Palmer when I was there. And I really attribute to him me understanding the philosophy and the depth and the congruency that I do today. Uh, I then uh, got connected to Sherman College when I uh, graduated, would go to their lyceums or homecomings. Um, and then a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I served on their board of trustees for, for about eight years, nine years. Another huge influence over me was Jim Sigathu. So if any of those people resonate for you, listen to their audios, listen to their books or read their books. When I graduated school, I had this belief that if people knew what I knew, that they would wanna do what I do. Well, I knew that chiropractic care could benefit a person from the moment they were born till the moment that they died. And that the benefit of having a spine free of nerve interference could only improve the quality of life that a person would have. So I knew that. I knew that if I could understand the importance of having a healthy nervous system, that if another person could understand that, that they too would want chiropractic care from the day they were born till the day they died. So I got really, really, really good when I was in school to learn how to communicate this idea of chiropractic, how to tell the story, how to explain the basic fundamental idea of chiropractic care in a very simple way. And probably my greatest teacher in that was Reggie Gold. And I talk about making the message simple. Reggie Gold knew how to take this idea and make it extremely simple for people to digest and understand. As you learn to tell the story and then you explain it to somebody, you realize very quickly that you got to tell it again and again and again. And people need to hear it multiple times before it begins to sink in. That became particularly evident to me when COVID happened last year, when SARS-CoV-2 became the craze and everybody locked down and shut down and patients, uh, you were calling, word coming in, they started to come in. They, I was shocked. I was really shocked that my patients would stop getting adjusted for a virus for a period of time. You know, they were, they were afraid to walk out the door. But then as they came in and then we started reminding them about the story, about the body as a self-healing, self-regulating organism, that this brilliant genius inside the body has dealt with things much worse than SARS-CoV-2. They said, oh yeah, oh yeah. And they realized probably the best thing I could do is get on the table and get adjusted. I said, yeah. Oh, and I should be bringing my kids in again. I said, yeah. So it's like the message was in there, but they needed to be reminded. And it just reminded me, how often do I need to hear something before I really get it? You know, how many of you understand chiropractic today better than you did a year ago? Hell, I hope you do. And you guys are committed to school. And how many of you are going to understand chiropractic better a year from now and five years from now? And you're chiropractors. So, so I, I realized that I, as much as I was disappointed that my patients didn't get it or thought they did get it, but there's so much out in this world that is so different than, than how we see the world. They need to be reminded what that story is. Best advice I'm going to give you in terms of learning how to tell the story is try to tell it in such a way that you're not telling, but you're asking. The more that you can engage a person in conversation and ask questions, they can begin to uncover and discover this big idea of chiropractic. Yesterday evening, I take care of a lot of humans, but I also take care of a lot of animals. Uh, probably in a week's time, I'll probably see 50 to 75 animal visits in my practice. Uh, 
mostly dogs, a few cats, a few horses, but I've seen the gamut. I've seen turkeys and roosters and guinea pigs and bunnies and, 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 and uh, uh, ducks and geese. And, and I've seen every kind of animal you can imagine, but mostly dogs. So I had a woman come with a new dog. She had she had been to a chiropractor. She lives 45 minutes from where I live. There aren't anybody else that sees animals. She sits down and she had been under chiropractic care and she, she knew chiropractic care was about the bone, about the bones being out of place. And, and she says, my dog, I think his bones are out of place. I said, can we have a conversation? She said, absolutely. I said, can we take what you know, what you, what would you know about chiropractic just for a little bit? Let's put it to the side. And let's have a conversation and let me introduce you to a, a, a perspective and see, see if it makes sense to you. She says, okay. So she took what you put to the side. And I said, I said, you know, chiropractors, although we, we do use bones of the body, I said, we really are much more interested in the system that controls everything in your body. Do you know what that is? And she said, uh, the brain. And I said, very good. The brain controls everything that happens in the body. I said, and let me ask you, do you think the brain was designed by nature to be flawed. And she looked at me, she says, nobody ever asked me that question before. And I said, do you think the brain was the designed by nature to be flawed? And she's paused, she says, I don't think so. I said, so I agree with you. I said, I don't think the brain is designed to be flawed. I think the brain is designed to have the body work properly. I said, if you were going to build a computer, wouldn't you build a computer for it to work right? She says, yeah. I said, I believe nature designed our brains to work right and to work in such a way that it controlled everything inside the body, everything, how your heart beats, how your liver works, how your kidney works, how you digest your food, how you deal with invasive organisms, diseases, and viruses, how you do everything is designed by this computer, the brain, to control everything inside your body. I said, do you know how that brain connects to all the parts of your body? And she says, nerves. And I said, very good. Nerves will connect the brain to the body. And she's nodding her head up and down. I said, I said, you just nodded your head up and down. I said, you did that because the brain sent energy to those muscles in the back of your neck and contracted them like that so you could move it. I said, you're completing a cycle of communication. You're not thinking about it. I said, your brain does it without you thinking. You felt I engage her in a conversation. And at the end of the time, she says, oh, you know, after you're telling me all this, I should probably still be getting adjusted. <laughs> and I said, you're not? And she says, well, I just go on my back hurts. And I said, oh, you can do that. I said, but don't, you, isn't it a good idea to keep the brain and body connected even when you're not hurting? She said, yeah. I said, well, that's what I want to do for your dog. I said, so start going back to your chiropractor and let's take care of Sparkle. And that's her dog's name. So isn't that a great name for, for a German Shepherd, Sparkle, right? So, so I adjusted Sparkle. And as soon as I adjusted Sparkle, she sees him watch. She says, Oh my God, he's walking normal again. I said, thank you. And I said, don't thank me. I said, yeah, the body did that. The genius that runs his body did that. So the more that you engage people in conversation, the, the, the greater that they're able to go through the rational process of what we do. Um, so I've done lots of different things in chiropractic. Um, wait a second. Oh yeah, I should probably tell you this. So I, I've, I've been in lots of different seminars. So I, I'm going to give you a little bit of personal history. Axel asked me to, to go through a little bit of, of my um, uh, growth in chiropractic. While I was in chiropractic school, there was a, a huge mentor of mine was a fellow by the name of Dr. Joe Felicia. He had started a program called Renaissance International with a colleague of his, Dr. Guy Reekman. Guy Reekman became president of Palmer, then he became president of, of Life University. Now he's chancellor of Life University. Uh, Joe and him were partners and they developed a patient education program called Renaissance. And it was one of the premier patient education programs. They had uh, chart lectures, they did videos, they made office charts. Um, and there've been many offshoots of theirs over the years, but he was actually a, a huge mentor. And, and after I graduated, I helped promote his seminars in Massachusetts. And then he asked me to teach for his program. So I taught for him for a period of time and that really began to develop my speaking skills. And as a result of that, I got to speak at different seminars like Fountainhead and audio seminars, which no longer exist and New Beginnings program in New Jersey. Actually, I'm speaking there this weekend. I spoke at Cairo Europe. So that was part of my initiation. I'm just a dumb chiropractor. I'm no different than any one of you. So hook up with your mentors, hang around the people you love. 
and, 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 and do what they do. And you will begin to open for yourself some of the things that you admire in them. Uh, a number of years after doing my thing with him, I met uh, Dr. Jeannie Ohm at New Beginnings in New Jersey. And Jeannie and I um, uh, became very, very good friends. We realized that in a past life, we must have been brother and sister because it's like the moment we met, it's sort of like our lives like whoa, whoa, crash. And, and we developed this very, very close connection. Um, she and I got connected. Uh, her husband, my wife also got connected. So she became a very, very close friend of mine. A few years later, I started teaching for her and then started uh, teaching for the ICPA very regularly. And I teach a course in pediatrics for them. Um, but I also then got to be on their board, uh, and I'm president of their board of directors uh, and I served as an advisor. Huge loss for our profession when she, when she passed away. I'm doing my thing, and, 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 and locally, we have a little philosophy group that we've started, and I come to find out now it's one of the longest continuing running philosophy groups in the world. So all that's, this started with a group of us, all new chiropractors in the area that just wanted to get together and support each other and love each other and share information. And we get together once a month. And after a few months of doing this, then we started to have people come and speak for us. And we did philosophy programs. So since the 19, uh, early 1980s, we've been doing a philosophy group in Massachusetts and have done it every month for the last umpteen years, since 1983. Since 1991, it's been at my home office practice that we've been having a philosophy group. And every month we have 20, 30, 40, 50, 80, sometimes 100 people come to my home. Once a month, we have a guest speaker. Even through COVID, every month we've had a meeting. We've had a meeting here. And we started after COVID to do it virtually. Uh, so we started doing that. I got involved with my state society. And then a few years later, I get asked to serve on the board of Sherman College. And I get on the board at Sherman. And, and uh, I, my first meeting, I'm there, and they're talking about closing the school. The school at that point had 152 students, and each year the enrollment was dropping. They were going into their savings more and more every year, and they thought it was great that the prior year before me getting on the board, that they only had to take a half a million dollars out of their savings. And I looked at the fellow who got me on the board and I said, and why the hell am I here? This is a sinking ship. And he says, I, I thought that uh, you, you helped me pull it out of the mud. <laughs> So we got the right people on the board, and uh, eight years later, the school is now, uh, well, actually 10 years now, and it's about 450 students, even through COVID, is growing and thriving. We did a $26 million campus improvement. Um, you never know what you're going to be called to do. I know nothing about running a board. I'm a chiropractor. I'm a dumb chiropractor. All I know how to do is analyze the spine and adjust the spine but I'm grounded and anchored in a perspective and a philosophical construct that allows me to see the world differently. And that perspective allows me to find solutions to problems when people say there are none. That allows me perspective to offer education to people when they feel that they're hopeless. So, so, so do not minimize your education and the simplicity of some of the things that you will learn. Stay involved. Stay engaged. Do not be an island unto yourself. Engage with your brothers and sisters in chiropractic. While you're in school, stay engaged in organizations, to stay informed, to stay aware, to educate them, to be the voice. If, if, I guarantee you, there are times when I am in a group of people who see chiropractic very different than I do, who see it as a limited medical specialty of treating aches and pains, strains, and, and see us as, 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 as a very small thing. And I'll be sitting in the room with them and they know my perspective is different. And the decisions that are made, whether they be political or academic, are influenced just by the fact that they know that I'm in the room. Do not minimize being grounded in your philosophical ideals and articulating those ideals. So I wanna give you the six secrets of success. You ready? Okay, yes? I need a nod up and down. Yes, the six secrets, okay, that this is it. You do these six things, I guarantee you, you'll have success in your practice and in your life. The first one is take care of everybody just like they were your family member. Take care of everybody as though they were your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your grandmother or grandfather, your, your son or your daughter. If everybody you put your hands on, you look at, 
as a human being that you love and care about as much as your own flesh and blood or the people that brought you into this world. And you hold that degree of integrity and honesty in everything you do, there will never be a problem that will happen in your practice. Everything you articulate, you articulate to them as though it's, it's, it's a family member. I, when I was early in practice, the practice consultants would say, well, when somebody comes in, you tell them, today we're going to do an evaluation on you to see if you're a chiropractic patient. <clears throat> could never say those words everybody is a chiropractic patient for me to say if you're a chiropractic patient i'd be lying so i needed to find words that worked for peter <clears throat> so i would say today we're going to do an evaluation to see how chiropractic can help you that works for me that's what i would tell my dad that's what i tell my kids Today, I'm going to do an evaluation to see how chiropractic can help you. Not if, I know it will help you. <clears throat> when you give recommendations, some people will say, well, let's take care of you for a few weeks and see how it goes. Then what? I don't ever want to stop care with somebody. People say, you can't tell patients that you want to see them for a lifetime. I said, why not? I want to see people for a lifetime. I want my spine adjusted for a lifetime. So when somebody comes in, and they, they, they start the process. I tell someone, I said, my goal, Mary, Joe, Phil, whatever their name is, my goal with every new patient is to develop a lifetime relationship with you. And I pause. I look at the look on their face and I said, I'm not asking you for a lifetime commitment. I said, I have a responsibility today to give you information so that you can see why many people in my practice choose to use chiropractic care for their general health and well-being for a lifetime. That's my responsibility. Your responsibility is to see if it makes sense to you and if you want to start down that road so we can improve your life and improve your life expression with very, very specific gentle chiropractic care. That's something I could tell to somebody I love. Can you use x-ray in, in uh, Barcelona, in, in Europe? No, you can't. You, no, yes, you can you, you cannot, you can't, okay. So in, in you can't, okay. So I can in the United States. <clears throat> so I, whether I'm going to take an X-ray or not is not dependent on whether they can afford it or not afford it. If I feel as though that's what I need so that I can best adjust the spine, then that's what I'm gonna do. If I feel as though I don't need it, then I won't do it. So every decision I make, I'm gonna make as though they are a family member. I, if you hear some banging in the background, that's because we're doing an office renovation. Uh, we have a beautiful home office. I loved it. Very homey. It feels like you're sitting in my living room. And my wife, my team said the office needs a facelift. So we were originally just going to paint, <coughs> change the front desk, because when we built our front desk, that we didn't have computers. Now it's all electronic. Uh, then we said, we were designing the front desk and we're now going to paint the walls. And they said, well, you know, the carpet's getting worn. Well, rather than putting carpet, we're going to put in vinyl plank flooring. So we're changing the floor. So it wound up being uh, moved from a very small renovation project to a huge reconstruction project, uh, both in magnitude and cost. Uh, and we originally were going to try to do it in while we practiced in the office. And it became very apparent that if we were going to do that, we probably would be in construction most of the year. And so my builder says, well, can you do something else? And so what we did is we got a trailer. So in the front of my home, we put a 60 foot trailer and we moved our office into that space. And most of the patients, when we told them we were gonna do that said, we're gonna be in a trailer. And they like made a face and said, um, and there's still, some people are still very skittish about being close to other people. I said, oh my goodness, I don't know if I wanna come in while you're in the trailer. How long is the construction gonna take? We put this trailer together and I should have created a little video for that so you could see it. And not one person stopped coming in because of the trailer. Every time a person has walked in, they said, I can't believe how nice this is. You guys could actually just move out here, forget doing anything in the office. It turned out, it's the nicest trailer trash you would ever find, okay? So, so it, it, it's amazing. And because some people were still worried about being on the inside, we put a little sitting area outside with cushions, like an outdoor lawn set. And we put a heater over them 
so so they could stay warm before they came inside if they wanted to. I put a space in my garage if that's where they wanted to get adjusted. The reason why I say this is uh, my, my sister even came in to get adjusted. She says, the only thing you need here is a fire pit to make marshmallows. You know, it's, it's, uh, 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 we tried to make it as homey and as loving, which is exactly what I would do for my family. So the decision to do it and even why we're doing the construction is because this is my family. And if they're going to come visit me every week, I want it to be the finest place that they can be. I want them to feel as though they're in an environment that is nurturing them. That, that environment that the energy was taken for them to have an experience when they come in that's warm that's loving that's compassionate that's service oriented that's fun that's that's clean that's that, that's contemporary so all of those pieces come in there and the process of being in the trail we even had a patients of ours who who make food they came with a food truck and we did taco night so uh, on a Friday afternoon, they came and they made tacos for all my patients. And, and people were sitting outside eating tacos and coming in, getting adjusted and playing music. Second secret to success, be honest. Be totally truthful with people. Don't deceive them on any level. Um, sometimes people will ask you a question and you don't know the answer. The best answer to give is, I don't know. And patients love it when I say that. And usually it's followed with, but your body knows. Let's keep your power switches open so that the intelligence that's running your body knows exactly what it needs to do. Let's care for your body. There's a lot of things I don't know. There's a lot of things that we do know about the physiology. And I try to explain the physiology to patients so that they can understand things. But there's a hell of a lot more that I don't know. Uh, we had a team meeting this morning. Uh, uh, once a month, we have a training. We go over things, and we're, we're working out details of moving back into our practice in a couple of weeks and some details that need to get handled. And in the process of the conversation, the staff had questions about the immune system and SARS-CoV-2 and vaccines, which are not conversations I usually have in the office. Uh, good, that's, that we could talk about that if you want to, but I wanted my staff to understand how the antibody response worked, what the T cell response was. And I tried to be as simplistic as possible. And I said, now I'm telling you, this is what we know, but there's a hell of a lot more we don't know. The immune system of the human body is one of the most complex, intricate pieces of our body chemistry and physiology. It integrates the body chemistry with the neurology, with the lymphatic system, with everything that happens around you. I said, so as much as we know how it works, we don't have any freaking idea. So to take a foreign agent and put it into your it, under your skin directly in there, I said, we can think we know, but we don't know. I said, we don't know what secondary and tertiary complications there are. I said, what we do know is when the body makes an antibody of it, uh, through its natural process, that it, it, it's looking at a much bigger framework than the antibodies that are made when you inject a foreign agent into the body something that's been genetically modified or made in the laboratory. So, so the body knows. So second thing is totally be honest with people. Totally be truthful. Don't feel as though you're ever selling people the care. People have an opportunity to receive care. You're giving, you're giving ways and means for them to improve their well-being. It's not selling a damn thing. And, and I, because I always, you know, some people say you are selling. Yeah, we are selling this. We are selling something and people are purchasing it. There's an exchange there. But I don't come at it as I'm trying to get them to buy a car as much as that I'm giving them the opportunity to improve their life and their health. Secret number three, and this has got three parts to it. Okay, secret number three is be affordable, be available, and be accessible. Be affordable, be available, and be accessible. Let's first talk about being accessible. Well, hell, I work in my home. You're not going to be more accessible than that. I'm all, I live here. So if they need me, I'm here. I also have no problem seeing people on a Sunday, a day I don't work, if they need me. If there's an emergency and they want to be here. Uh, there have been times that I'm closed on a Tuesday. Tuesdays, I usually don't work. Um, and I have a patient who is a regular patient. And I take care of her and her family. And one of their children gets injured on the soccer field or playing football. And they, they'll be seriously injured. And they're in the car and they're driving to the hospital to have them checked out. And they're driving by my home. They'll come down the driveway, they ring the bell. And they say, you know, Johnny was just injured. Or they'll text me on my phone. 
I'll see them. As long as I feel confident being able to see them. If it was my brother, if it was my child, would I see them? Hell, I would. So I want people to feel that level. And it's never abused. Never once has it been abused in 38 years. So people know that I'm accessible. Many of my patients have my cell number. Okay, And for a person that's seeing hundreds of people in a week, influencing thousands of people in my community, I don't have a problem with that. Because people are so respectful of my time. And they also know, going back to, to the secret number two, they also know I'll always be honest. That if I can't see them, that I, I, I will be honest with them and that I can't. I said, but once somebody's committed themselves to me, to being in my practice, I am 100% committed to them. There are many practice consultants out there who will advise you against that. They will tell you that, that you need to have these rigid boundaries, that it's your job and you show up those hours, they need to make it work, and this is what it's going to cost, and they don't, they, they, there's no, 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 no budging on that. That doesn't work for me. That's not my persona. My, my persona is I'm a, I'm, I'm a lover and I'm a giver. That's, the, that's where I am. So in that space, I'm going to be extremely generous. Unless I feel as though somebody abuses me, then I'm totally at honest with them. Just to say, said, I don't think that that, 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 I don't feel in balance with that. I can't do that. So I'm, I'm very protective. I set very clear boundaries. At the same time, I, I will bend them when appropriate. Uh, so I always feel accessible uh, I, and I always be available. And by that being available, I start early in the morning. Uh, three days a week, I'll start at 6 a.m. and I work till 6.30 p.m. in the afternoon. So I start very often before people are going to work and I'll work until they come home. When I had children, I, I moved my schedule to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., three days a week. Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, Sundays, I took off so I could be with my family. So I was there to serve during those times, 100%, gave 1,000% while I was in the office, and then I took the other days off unless of course somebody really needed me and I would see them. So that's what I did now. My kids are older, they're off on their own, they're married. So Tuesdays I work two hours in addition in the morning. I work six to eight in the morning. The rest of Tuesday morning is my administrative time. It's when we have team meetings, team trainings, catch up on my paperwork, things to do and uh, that nature. Thursdays I take off and Saturdays in the morning I'll work for a few hours if I'm in town. Third part of, of, of number three is be affordable. Create a fee structure that allows people to afford your care. And I don't know what legalities there are in, in, in Spain or in Europe. Uh, most of my practice is, has no type of, of insurance or government subsidy of care. Most of my patients pay out of their pocket cash for coming into my, into my office. 92% of my practice is paying total cash and has nobody reimbursing them from the government or from insurance companies or, or, or anything else. <clears throat> if I charged, uh, in, I'm going to use US dollars. If I, the average cost of an adjustment in the United States is between 50 and 75 US dollars per visit. So one visit costs between 50 and $75. Let's say there was a family of four, a mother, father, and two children. And if I had to charge each of them $50, the lower end of that, for every time they came in the office as a family, it would cost $200. If I want that family to come in once a week forever, which is what I want with, for my patients, that will be over $10,000 per year. Most families could not afford to pay that. So I, realizing that, if that's what I want, I want people to come in once a week forever, I need to create a fee system that makes that possible. So you need to make the choice in your life. How often do you want to get adjusted? How often do you want to be on a table? I wouldn't want a week to go by that I don't get my spine checked. So if I want that for me, then I need to offer that to my patients. I, I, need, to, I need to make that possible for people to get what I get for me, what I get do for my kids, what I do for my, my mom and dad. So I want to be able to allow people to get care once a week for themselves and their families forever. So I create a fee structure that makes that real. Secret number four, make the concept of vertebral subluxation real. What we do is analyze and adjust spinal subluxation. That is the unique clinical service that we offer. That needs to be made real for people. Very often what people wind up doing 
they uh, chiropractors who are subluxation oriented chiropractors. There are different ways that they can practice. People will come in and say, oh, I don't treat your headache. I'm going to adjust this thing that's called a subluxation. I'm going to be focused on the subluxation. So let me correct your subluxation. When the subluxation goes away, that headache might go away. And so they correct a the subluxation because they're really offering a treatment of another condition. The problem with that is when, that, when the treatment of that condition, when the headache goes away, the patient's going to go away. So it's really important that we build the importance of having a subluxation adjusted, a subluxation addressed, whether it's connected to a symptom or not. Now, that's a process that's going to take time. But the languaging that we use to make the concept of subluxation real is not to eliminate the medical diagnosis, not even to focus on it. That's not what we do. But it's to build the reality of a spinal subluxation. Well, hell, the dental profession has been doing that for ages. People go in with a toothache and they explain to you the importance of the health and well-being of the teeth and the gums of brushing and flossing the teeth and the gums, of seeing your hygienist on a regular basis to make sure your teeth and gums stay healthy. Because when your teeth and gums stay healthy, that's the best thing you can do for your body. Does that mean you're not gonna get cavities? That you're not gonna have a toothache? Of course not. I brush and floss my teeth every day. I still get dental cavities. I sometimes need dental work done, okay? So just because you get your spider just doesn't mean that you're not gonna have medical problems. And sometimes, Chiropractic care is what they need. Sometimes it's medical care that they need. But you should still take care of, of the teeth and gums the same way you should take care of the spine. So taking care of the spine is an important part of their life. The other thing that is a journey, I'm going to say these words, and most of you are, are going to say, how the hell do you do that? What we don't want to do is move them from a medical pathology to a subluxation pathology. And this is one of the key factors of what happens in practice is people, instead of saying that they're treating the headache or back pain or sciatic or bedwetting or the neurological defects, whatever they are. No, we're not treating those. What we're doing is treating these subluxations. And we're going to address these subluxations because subluxations are bad. And I'm not saying that they're good, but subluxations are bad. So we're going to try to treat that badness. So we just created a new pathology in their lives. I, I believe that the role of the subluxation is to be a key focal point of our clinical service. But we don't need to pathologize the subluxation as much as we need to get people looking at the benefits of a healthy functioning nervous system. That what you want is the best life expression that you can have, a nervous system that is adaptive to the world as best as possible. And what the subluxation is, is our window into their physiology of the best way that we can put a force into that system to allow a better life expression, to allow the nervous system to not hold aberrated patterns from the past. You see, I propose to you that when a subluxation occurred, at the moment that the subluxation occurred, it was the most intelligent thing that the innate wisdom of the body could do at that time. If the body did not subluxate, something worse would have occurred. Based upon our philosophical ideals, the innate wisdom of the body is 100%. Everything the brain and the nervous system strives for is going to be toward the betterment of the body. To allow the, When the body compromises a, cell, a sense of itself by allowing a subluxation to exist within that neurology, it's doing so because if it didn't, something worse would have occurred. That if the spine didn't subluxate in that motor vehicle accident, that person might not be alive. So recognizing that and owning that, the subluxation is not the pathology at all. That saved their life. The issue is when the subluxation occurred, it was an absolutely necessary thing to happen, but the neurology is now holding that adverse tension in the spinal cord. And it's carrying it to a, a moment in time when it's no longer in an accident. What we want to do is bring the neurology and the physiology into a greater state of life expression in this moment in time and make the best choices and decisions for that physiology at that moment in time. Now, that's not something I explain to patients as much as I do to chiropractors. Once you own that, you then will create the language that is congruent with that. 
Rather than saying we're fixing your lower back, we're fixing your neck, we're going to adjust you. We're going to keep pressure off those nerves. We're going to allow that neurology to repattern, reprogram itself as best as possible so your body can have its best life expression. One of the suggestions I'm going to give you in the process of you engaging in relationship with your patient, when you're doing a consultation, so much of what the person is going to be sharing with you when you start doing your consultation is the problem that they have. The condition that they feel as though they're walking to you with, the back pain, the headache, the sciatica. And what I'm going to suggest that you do is in the process of that consultation, ask them, what is this keeping you from in your life? What is this experience that you're having keeping you from in your life? What, what quality of your life is reduced? Oh, I can't get on the floor and play with my grandchildren. I can't run a marathon. I don't have the energy at work that I really, really want. I'm not able to, to, to think clearly throughout the day. I'm not able to prepare meals for my kids. I'm not able to give birth at home. So once you know what that is, you then can change languaging. Say, rather than us focusing on getting get rid of your headaches, rather than us focusing on getting rid of sciatica, rather than focusing on getting rid of bedwetting, Let's focus at getting you to run that marathon again. Let's focus on getting back on the floor playing with your grandchildren. Because that has an emotional cord in their life. That attaches to something very deep that means something to them. Plus, it's what we are creating rather than what we are taking away. Which is a huge thing in healthcare. The moment that somebody feels as though you're taking something from them, it's something like, oh, I don't want that to happen forever. But if something that we are giving to them, we're giving them the opportunity to get on the floor and be with their kids again, to run a marathon, to be able to think clearly at school, to be able to sit in classroom all day, to be, have energy at work. That is an emotional cord to them. You're constantly giving that to them. So they are coming to you for service. So rather than viewing something that we're taking away, it's something that we are giving to them. Fifth, fourth concept, make the concept of vertebral subluxation real. Number five, deliver the goods. Be good at what you do. Know how to analyze the spine, determine the area that you're going to push and give an adjustment, and know that you've done it. Be clear in your technique. Own it. Don't just do it, but own it. Every system of analysis. Every technique that is taught has a system of analysis. Thompson technique has a system of analysis. Gunstead technique has a system of analysis. SOT technique, sacro occipital technique has a system of analysis. Upper cervical procedures have a system of analysis. Network techniques have a system of analysis. Every system that you learn has its own integrity of a spinal model and an analytical process that, that they use. Own it. And most chiropractors I know integrate many techniques together. Okay. They'll use a little bit of Gonstead, a little bit of Thompson, a little bit of SOT, and they'll integrate it together. Be clear in the system of analysis you use. And also realize <clears throat> the goal is not to take a person and bring them into your technique as much as it is to take all of the technical knowledge you have and mold it to the needs of that person's neurology. There's some people who will come in and I'll do a very Thompson-oriented analysis and system of adjustment. Some people will come in, I'll do very SOT-oriented system of analysis, some very upper cervical orientation. And it's a whole conversation that beyond that, that I, I'm not going to get into right now. And how do I make that determination? Okay. Develop your systems. You are new in school. You're going to learn technique your entire lifetime. I've been doing the gig 38 years. I know more technique than I can possibly imagine. I want to learn more. Okay. The, 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 there's, it's a never ending journey of understanding how we can sensitize ourselves to a person's neurology and determine the best force applications into that system. The system, the, 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 the technique that I didn't mention in any of those is diversified. Diversified is a force application. It is not a technique. It's a force application. A technique is both an analysis and a force application. 
So Thompson technique utilizes the drop table. Uh, use a drop when you provide the force. But the analysis is the most important part. Gonstead, you know, has very specific force applications, but you could do a Gonstead analysis and a diversified force application. You could do a Thompson analysis and an SOT force application. You could do an activator analysis and a Gonstead force application. So utilize the systems and procedures that real that 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 work for you. And it it and each one is going to be so different based upon who you are, your personality, your, your dexterity with your hands, your self-confidence, how you like to get adjusted. I'm going to tend to adjust people the way I like to get adjusted. That's going to be what I'm going to tend to do. Some people love utilizing an instrument, but that's how they like getting adjusted. I, I don't mind getting adjusted with an instrument, but I don't do a lot of instrument adjust. It doesn't make it wrong. Be specific. Okay, I'm not into the HEFO technique. H-E-F-O. Have you ever heard of the HEFO? H-E-F. It's called hit every friggin' one. Hit every bone. Hit them high. Hit them low. Just keep hitting them. I'm not, I don't do that. Okay. You're doing general manipulations can make an effect on people. I don't know if it's a good effect or not. So the number five is deliver the goods. And number six, the last one is work hard. Okay. Work hard. Okay, it's 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 good. It's going to be continuous process of developing your art. Technique is only a piece of what we do, though. Communication is an important part of what you're going to learn, and again, you develop it over time. You develop the skill over time. Marketing is a skill you need to learn. How do you market yourself? Some people don't want to market themselves. How do you find a way based upon your personality, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, to let the world know that you're here to serve them? You're here to care for them. You're here to help them. You need to find successful ways and step out of your comfort zone and market yourself. It's very uncomfortable for most of us to try to sell ourselves to the world. But find strategies that allow you to get the word out of what you do. Most of us have no idea how to create financial systems. Okay? School will teach you how to be a chiropractor. They'll teach you how to do the clinical aspects of it. But how do you figure out how you're going to charge people? What are your fee structures going to be? And then how do you manage your own finances? That's a hat you really need to wear. If you're going to own a business, you need to know the basics of business. I'm not a business major. Okay? I have a patient of mine was one of the wealthiest men in my practice. He He's bought and sold many businesses. The last business he sold, I think he sold for $43 million. And he, he is a consultant all over the world. He teaches locally at a, uh, at a business school, uh, a, a class on entrepreneurship. And I go to Eddie and I said, Eddie, give me the, give me the, 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 the notes on business. I said, give me a, a quick class. How do I become a good businessman? He says, Peter, it's really, really simple. I said, what's that? Says, you got to make more money than you spend. I said, that's it. He says, yeah. He says, I'm going to tell you, these graduate level business majors sometimes forget that. He said, just make more money than you spend. So I, I just gave you basic business tools. Uh, how, most of us have no idea how to be a boss. How are you going to employ people? So there are lots of, of, of things you work on in your practice. So it's not just developing. Yes, you're working on your technique. You get good at it. You got to work in your communication. You get good at it. How to do a report of findings. You got to get good at it. But then you got to wear all these other hats. You got to be the boss. You got to be the manager. <clears throat> you got to be the finance consultant. You need to be the, the, the marketing person in your practice. So all of those things you need to the, the, don't ever stop it. I, I work harder today on my practice than I ever have. But it's not work. And ask for help. Don't try to do this alone. You hire people. You know, it's a, the hardest thing for me one time was, was to hire somebody to walk, clean my house. I said, I gotta, why am I going to pay somebody to clean my house? I said, I could do that. Anybody could clean the house. Why am I going to spend, you know, 50, 100, whatever dollars it is? To, I'm going to pay somebody to clean it. But you know what? When I started paying somebody to clean my house, it freed up so much space in my life. I didn't need to take a weekend every month to, 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 to wipe down the house and clean it. I, I love working my yard, mowing the lawn, edging, mulching. But you know what? I love it when my, my landscapers come doing that and I'm there adjusting patience. He's doing what he loves. I'm doing what I love. 
And if I ever want to go out and mow the lawn or mulch a little bit, I can, but I don't have to. So, so be efficient with the utilization of your energy units. And granted, most of you are debt right now. You don't have any money to do it. But as you're doing it, don't be penny wise and dollar foolish. Sometimes it makes more sense to give to other people those things that you would be better off taking your time and energy to do something else. Yeah, I, I, I know how to work on cars. When I was growing up, I, I was really good at doing oil changes and things of that sort. You know what? I could change the oil of my car. I can do a tune-up of my car. I could take care of it. But why do that? When I could give my car to somebody else, let him do it, and I could be adjusting my patience. So make decisions about what you're going what, what to do. So those are the six secrets to success. But the underscore of all of that is really look at what drives what you do. What drives what a patient does? Most people today do things out of fear. I'm going to propose to you, when you're doing things out of fear, growth, healing, never really happens. Most patients come to us in a state of fear. They're afraid something is seriously wrong with their body. Doctors for years have used fear as the motivating factor. I believe that fear is one of the most powerful human emotions. <clears throat> it's a powerful gift that's been given to us by our creator to move us through crisis. Fear is what allows a person to move into a fight or flight response so that they can push through crisis. A mother sees her child being injured by something falling on them, and she gains strength to lift a car off of her child, something that she can't do normally because the adrenaline response, the norepinephrine and epinephrine response in her body is so powerful. <clears throat> she gains that superhuman strength. Sometimes somebody hearing a fear of a physiological issue <clears throat> gives them the motivation to start caring for their body better. Spontaneous remission occurs. I believe that fear can move us through crisis, but it has nothing to do with healing. So when people are motivated by fear, they're moving away from a crisis or trying to avoid something going wrong. I believe you want to connect people to their love and to their passion, to their love and passion of their bodies, to their inner truth, to their own inner knowing, to their self-empowerment. One of the things that we need to look at first for ourselves is what's driving us to do what we do in our lives. Are we exercising because we don't want to get heavy? We don't want to gain weight. We don't want to have health problems. Or are we exercising to maximize the expression of physicality in our lives? Are we eating certain foods because it's the right and best thing we can do for our body or to avoid having another problem? Sometimes it's cloudy. What motivates us to do what we do? What motivates a patient to do what they do? I propose the more that we can move toward moving in this direction of growth, of love, of passion, of self-empowerment, the less that we utilize fear is the motivating factor. Over the last year and a half, we've had an entire planet transformed into a state of fear, fear of a virus something that they can't see, an enemy. And that enemy doesn't just live in the air, it lives in the other people. I can't see their faces, I have to wear a mask. I can't even look at people. I can't be with other people. I have to have plastic between me and another person. That other human beings aren't safe. This is one of the greatest damages we've ever done to the human species on planet Earth. I believe it is bad as any other plague that we've ever had, it's a plague of fear. I've said in my practice throughout this last year and a half, what we have done because of this virus is worse than any virus could ever do. It's done more damage. The amount of loss that we've had in our world, loneliness, people dying alone, suffering in hospitals, not being able to be surrounded by the people that love them. Being able to be alone, moving into states of depression, more substance abuse existing on our planet than ever before, more divorce, more domestic violence, more health issues. The greater, the, there's no greater, the, the, the la, ages, I just read this study, between the ages of 21 and 30, more suicides have taken place over the last 12 months than ever in the history of humanity. That's disgusting. 
That's because people have moved into the state of fear. Stephen Porges pro proposed a theory of the neurology about 15 years ago called the ventral vagal or the polyvagal theory. Porges proposed that <clears throat> the way the neurology works is that the autonomic nervous system works in some aspects of it. It does not work in a reciprocal nature, but it actually works in tandem. What we are taught in school is that when sympathetics go up, parasympathetics go down. And when parasympathetics go up, sympathetics go down. And it's a reciprocal system. Porges proposed that some aspects of how we live our lives via the autonomic nervous system work in tandem. That the only way that we can have a engaging response if community in bonding, in fellowship, in love of one another, is when, this, when, hello, go away. Can you, is that too loud? I'm sorry about that. They're cutting something. It'll stop in a second. That you need to suppress or inhibit the sympathetic response. Porges proposed that the ventral aspects of the vagus nerve are what are, is what gets activated when a mother gives birth and bonds with her child, when people come together in communities, when people come together in celebration as families, that it's the ventral vagal response that really builds the well-being of people and is empowered through states of love and compassion and cooperation and collaboration. That when we move into a sympathetic response and we move into fight or flight, that it doesn't allow that aspect to exist. But something worse can occur. He believes the dorsal aspects of the vagus nerve get activated when we move into deep states of survival, when we move into places where we don't feel safe, like a turtle going inside their shell. That when the dorsal aspects of the vagus nerve are no longer inhibited, but those are active, that people withdraw. Through this entire process of SARS-CoV-2 and adapting through it through COVID-19, this is what people were forced to do. When 9-11 occurred, it moved us into a sympathetic state. The whole world became very vigilant, okay? The whole world said, oh my goodness, what's happening? Particularly in the United States, but even worldwide. But healing was found by going into churches, into our communities, into fellowship, into friendships. Through this pandemic, people were not moved into a sympathetic state, they were moved into a withdrawal state. We were not even allowed to go to churches, to come into community, to be in our schools. It was one of the worst damages that damaging pieces to the human neurology that's ever occurred. People need to feel safe in order to have a sympathetic response. People, once the sympathetic response is handled and the fight or flight is gone, they need to move into the ventral vagal response of community. I believe this is what we create. We create community with adjustments. We build well-being and vitality through allowing people to connect to this inborn innate intelligence inside their body to fully express itself in the nervous system. When we come into community and we create a resonant field of people being subluxation free, trusting one another and trusting their physiology, the planet changes, community changes. This is what we create in the environments of our practices. The more clinical we stay, the more that we keep people in states of fear and withdrawal, the more we perpetuate the dysfunction in our planet. And if what we wanna do is contribute to the well-being of our planet, not only do we need to adjust civilizations, we need to open doors of possibility for people to come into states of ease, to come into states of community, ultimately trust, trusting their physiology, trusting life within their body, trusting that their body can have a better life expression and trusting one another, trusting people, okay? I can't tell you how, how, to, how to have somebody trust you except just do it. Take care of people like family and eventually it happens. There's not a doubt in the mind of any one of my patients that I, don't, I will do my very best to serve them and to love them. And I'll always be honest with them. But that's not something I can ever tell them. It only happens over time. 
People need to feel safe. So I believe feeling that safety within our practices happens in the environment that you create. It happens with the walls. It happens with the pictures. It happens with the music. It happens with your words. But ultimately, it happens with your intention. So why don't I end it there and open it up for questions? I, I can't believe it. I looked, just looked at the clock. I've gone over an hour. So let's open it up. If you got any questions, any comments, I, I, I got loads more notes. I mean, I could talk forever. So. Super. Thank you so much, Peter. It was really good. Uh, we got actually two questions from uh, Nicola. Maybe, Nicola, do you want to ask, ask them? Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. The, the first one was like, uh, you said like, you know, uh, we have to be good in one of your five, in, in your six uh, secrets. But uh, my question is, uh, you know, in order to be good, you want to master into something. How can we master into something if we just then try so many different things and we never master into anything? Like, are we going to be jack of all trades, master of none? Or should we just focus maybe on on only few techniques? Uh, you know, okay. yeah, it's, it's of course good to have interest in many things, but I see in school too many people like doing too many stuff. And uh, I don't know. To me, it's just like you're you're playing with the too many different factors. Like one one system utilizes certain factors, certain indicators. Another system u- utilizes other. If you mix all that, I don't know. I think it's a rabbit hole. Excellent question, Nicola. Nicola, is that correct? Yeah. I said. said one hundred percent right. And I, I I think you're asking the question from a technique world, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, ha, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back and ask you a question. Okay. Keep your keep your microphone on. How did Clarence Gonstead develop his technique? He just tried on people. He tried on on people, but he, he also applied the he was applying the philosophy. Because the I philosophy agree. without the up, its application would be nothing, but he was trying on right, different but, people. But 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 did he create God? Did he wake up one morning and say, "I'm going to create a technique today"? No, no. I no. mean, he he was an upper cervical doc, uh, same as you. He, at first, uh, like the BJ all in one, and then kind of through his understanding of mechanical engineering and mm-hmm. other experiences and meeting Grostic, he. He developed then. 100%. Yeah. So, so it's not like he woke up one day and says, I'm going to create a new technique. Oh, it's he, lear- he, yeah. he, he learned something. And he, he then started to, to, to do things a little bit differently. Right? Yeah. I, I don't believe that what he did at that moment, as he began to develop his technique, came completely from his left brain and analytical mind. That there was a portion of it that came from a very intuitive connection that he made with the person he was serving. And I believe every technique happened that way. I believe that Clay Thompson did did that in his work. Hugh Logan did it with his work. Major DeJarna did it with his work. Larry Webster did it with his work. Donnie Epstein did it with his work. That they, he, he learned various techniques. And then as he began to apply them to a person, he took what he learned, but then he modified it and began to look at things differently. But he became solid and clear in the technique that he was applying to a person at any moment in time. And the same way that Thompson did, that Donnie Epstein does, the major did, or any other practitioner has done. I believe that every single human being who is a chiropractor is developing their own technique. Because as the person created their technique, it was a combination integration of their left brain and their right brain that came together that says, aha, this is what I'm going to do. There is something that happens when you adjust a person that if I was doing the exact same system of analysis, the exact same window into that person's body, that when I'm on that person, I have my hands on them, it will be different. Because you're who you are and I am who I am. So I am all for people becoming a master at what they do. And that mastery may come from studying only one system of analysis and learning that system of analysis. It may come from learning two. It may come from learning 10. Okay? But it becomes coming fully grounded 
and clear technically and philosophically of what you're trying to do. Let me ask you a question. Put chiropractic aside for a moment. Have you ever made, and, and you don't need to answer, but answer it in your mind. Have you ever made love to more than one woman or man? I don't know your sexual preference. Is it the same experience? No. no. The biology is the same. In a heterosexual relationship, you take the penis, put it inside the vagina, rub it around for a while, and it feels good. Okay? The, 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 the biology of sex is the same. Right? But it's not making love. And who I am with a person, one person, is different than who I am with another person because the chemistry of those people is very different. The souls and spirits of those people is very different. I believe that a spinal adjustment is just as intimate as making love with a person in a non-sexual way. It's the merging together of two souls and spirits that have come together at that moment in time for a sacred experience. And that sacred experience is allowing both people to become a better version of themselves. There are systems of analysis. There are things that you can learn in how to make love. But ultimately, it's that moment in time exactly what occurs between two souls and spirits. So mastery is an individual journey. And the mastery exists not just in the individual, but in the experience that they have with every person that they are with. The greatest thing that I can give you is be totally present with the person that you are serving. That complete level of presence at that moment in time, when you have your hands on somebody and doing your dance, whatever that system is that you choose to follow, will be the right thing to do for that person and you to move forward. Some of you will become very analytical. And right now as a student, you want to put somebody inside of an algorithm. The algorithm of the technique that you're following, whether it's upper cervical work or Gonstead protocol or Thompson protocol or whatever system that you're following, there's nothing wrong with that. That is how we all learn in the same way that if you're learning how to play tennis or golf, you will learn what the pro teaches you in terms of technique. But mastery comes in you taking that and then making it yours and owning precisely that's what it is that you are doing. That is an art form that happens over time. And there's a spectrum of how people will do that. Some people will become very rigid in their process. Some will become very eclectic as they mix various things together. But what I am asking all of you to do, it is not the technique that creates the master. It's the individual that takes the technical things that you were taught and creates mastery from that. If you saw me adjust, you will see me integrating together probably a half a dozen different technical systems. But there won't be a doubt in your mind that when that person walks off the table, that they are in a greater state of ease and adaptability. And I can guarantee you whatever indicators you utilize to determine a person's subluxation that is free of, of nerve interference, they would be clear, okay? Because I know that. So, so the systems that I utilize is that process. To, to, so to say uh, uh, the, the jack of all trades, I don't consider myself a jack of all trades at all. I am a very specific spinal adjuster but I'm integrating together the knowledge and wisdom of people that have come before me, as well as every, every adjustment that I've given in my lifetime to become a master of that technique. So it is a journey, not, a, not, not just a destination. It's a continuous journey. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, 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 yeah, yeah, I mean, totally. You did, you did, no, that was a great, great answer. Um, but then my question comes like, you know, in from Stevenson, from C note as well, like we know that the vertebral subluxation has, you know, the MOPI component of it. But then how can some technique maybe that don't even touch the spine can can address that? Or is that still chiropractic or is you know uh, great question. Great question. Because I mean it's we have a philosophy, science, and art cannot be just philosophy, cannot be just science, cannot be just art. So absolutely, absolutely. So I guess the yeah the, the concept of vertebral subluxation is that there's uh, Stevenson uh, mentions in his book and the original definition of subluxation, it's a misalignment less than a dislocation, less than a luxation, which impinges nerves and interferes with the transmission of metal impulses. Okay. Uh, and it's not just a misalignment, it's a misalignment of a vertebra in relationship to the one above or the one below, less than a luxation, which impinges nerves and interferes uh, with the transmission of metal impulses. I believe that's the exact definition of MOPI. Mm -hmm. um, 
that was a definition that began that, that was given to us in the early part of the 1900s. And I, 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 I believe wholeheartedly that it is still an outstanding definition conceptually. There's been tremendous investigation from a technical perspective that holds sacred the vertebral subluxation, that what we take care of and address is a spinal subluxation, but does not view the subluxation as an involvement of a motor unit. There are many techniques like Harrison's technique, Pettibon technique, even some aspects of Thompson technique, Logan basic technique, that, that look at other aspects of it where it's not relegated to a motor unit. So the original definition viewed the subluxation was an impingement through a compressive lesion upon the neurology. And not all subluxations are compressive lesions. I believe that there can be adverse mechanical cord tension creating a subluxation. Okay, that there's an intimate relation between structure and function. There's some techniques that you view spinal biomechanics in terms of involvement, the curves of the spine, or how the body centers itself, how the body is centered, you know, if it's plumb to the body, that you know, looking at the relationship of the shoulders to the pelvis. I mean, there's many biomechanical orientations and many neurophysiological orientations. So I'm not making Mopi wrong. I believe that it was the beginning of our technique. But as we grow in our understanding and our perceptions of the various spinal models that exist, I believe that, that, that it may be lacking in terms of understanding uh, and understanding primarily the neurophysiology from 1930 to 2021. You know, we, we, there's so much more that we know about the neurophysiology that wasn't understood back then. Conceptually, it's very accurate. But I think uh, um, uh, uh, Scientifically, I think there's a lot of lack to Mopi because much of how we address the spine today isn't a compressive lesion on a nerve root. Okay, it could be facilitation. It could be other forms of adverse neurological impact due to biomechanical distortions. The other thing with Mopi is it implies that the bone is at cause, that the bone creates nerve interference. I believe sometimes it could be adverse stresses upon the neurology that creates biomechanical distortions. So that, that I believe they happen concurrently, that there's a neurophysiological aberration as well as a biomechanical distortion, and they occur simultaneously. But it's not always the bone that causes nerve interference. That, that, that then is saying that you need to have, always have a physical thing creating neurological irritation. I believe there can be neurological distortion. Put a person under tremendous amounts of stress, hold them in states of fear, they can alter their biomechanics, but the bone isn't causing it. It's the neurology that caused the biomechanical distortion. You, you ever take somebody, do you, do you ever, have you ever done a diversified adjustment on somebody? Supine yeah, position, modified vertebrae? Yes. Okay, so you've done that, right? Have you ever had it done to you and, and the person yeah, setting up on you? Yes. And, and the person setting up on you, okay? And, and your body, you're saying to yourself, that ain't gonna move, okay? That's not biomechanical, it ain't going to move. That's a neurological, that ain't going to move. The, the, the neurology is firing, it's, it's putting all the muscles into facilitation, saying, hell, you're going to hurt me if you do this. Okay? Sometimes a diversified adjustment, you could bring the attention, the body says, oh my God, yes, do me. And, and even before they put a thrust in there, the joint cavitates. That's the neurology saying, yes, this is what, exactly what I needed. Okay? So I, I, I'm not making diversified right or wrong but it's determining the right place, right time, and to being clear with, with your perception of what the neurology can, can handle. It's like making love. Sometimes it's forceful. Sometimes it's extremely genteel. And both can be extremely passionate. So an adjustment is exactly the same thing, okay? It's applying a very specific force in a very specific way in the very specific time for that person in that state with that round, amount of force. It's not, I don't want you to take a person and put them into a technical protocol. To do that assumes that everything that was developed in that technique was known when that technique was developed. Every person that's developed its technique, take a guess. It was their best guess. Innate is the only thing that is 100%. The innate intelligence of the body is the only thing that is 100% in terms of what we, what we are playing with. We are taking our best guess utilizing the systems of analysis of, of, the, uh, of the forefathers and foremothers of our profession that we're learning and we download and we take that and honor that space, but we tweak and do what we need to as we serve that person. 
We mold our knowledge to the needs of that person's physiology. So back to your question, it's a very deep question and we could go at this for 12 hours, okay? But, but I believe that yeah. the mas mastery happens in a continuous discipline and continuous searching to continue to improve your technical art. And for some people, that's to stay in a speeder board all day long. There's nothing wrong with that, to develop your toggle recoil. For others of you, it's gonna to be to do a triceps pull better, like Ralph Gregory was developing with Nuka. For others of you, to do a, a cervical chair adjustment even better. But all of those are force application. I'm gonna to propose to you, more important than that is your analytical system to determine what is the best way for me to put a force into the body, okay? I'll tell you, Donnie Epstein, and I, I use him as an example, he's a huge mentor of mine, has adjusted me barely touching my body, barely touching, putting a force in my body, and I've had joints cavitate in my body, okay? Ralph Gregory adjusted my upper cervical spine, didn't touch me, did not touch me, adjusted my atlas, and so, took a post x-ray and showed a change. The force application of his hand, his pisiform was not touching my neck and I felt the bone move, okay? So it's beyond, but there was such clarity and laser beam focus of what he was doing. And that's what matters, that you have total clarity, total focus of the force that you're putting into the body, the force, the direction, and the system that you're utilizing to clear that nerve neurology. Did I, did I answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Nobody? Uh, I'm just without words. What's that? I'm just without words. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, the accent is getting me. You're still? I don't have any words. I'm, I'm just like, whoa. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll end it. So you guys can all leave. And I've got an hour and a half. You guys are going to get tired of hearing me. If you, if you haven't figured out, I love our profession. And my read, just watching you, even though it's been through this, mean, most of you, I think, love chiropractic as much as I do. <clears throat> Find your dance. Find the expression of this profession. Stay grounded in our philosophy. Okay. I didn't do a philosophy talk to you. I gave you a talk from my heart. Be grounded and understand the principles by which we came from and realize it's our job to learn from our forefathers and foremothers. What they gave us, we learn and understand what they understood or strive to, see what they saw. But it's ultimately to stand on their shoulders and to create new worlds, to create new directions, because the planet needs us. They need us to bring healing to this planet. We are carrying an important light for this planet. We're not here to sit on the laps of our forefathers and foremothers. We're here to take what they've given us and take it to the greatest dimension. Our philosophy will continually evolve, staying grounded in the philosophical tenets that we started with. Life expresses intelligence and the nervous system is the greatest expression of that in terms of creating functional integrity in the body. And we, we are an answer that people need and things that the world needs right now. Don't minimize that. <clears throat> Don't minimize that perspective and that ideal that we have. But it happens by connecting with people one at a time, one adjustment at a time. Okay, that's all I do. All I do is love people and adjust people. <clears throat> and in that process, you see life change. I can tell you, <clears throat> somebody says, uh, one time I did a talk, he says, can you tell me about the miracles that have happened in your practice? Mm -hmm. And I looked at them and I said, every adjustment is a miracle. Every adjustment is a miracle. Some of the miracles we will see where bedwetting goes away or pain goes gone or, or tumors fall off. Some miracles we don't see. And those are the problems that people don't have. The aches or pains that they won't have. The distortions, diseases that they won't occur. But the real miracle is the miracle of life doing its dance. Allowing people to move out of that state of withdrawal and fight or flight and come into a state of ease and adaptability. Come into that place of love and compassion because there is no force on this planet that's more powerful than that. And you're gonna find that first by looking inside yourself, look in a mirror and say, how much can I love me? How much can I serve the creator? And then flip that mirror and allow people to see that same genius inside themselves. 
You see, we're not here to be the guru or the genius, but it's to awaken that inside of the people we serve. They're the only healer they're going to have. It's not the adjustment. It's not the chiropractor. It's not you or me. It's them. And the fundamental tenets of our philosophy come back to empowering the individual to see the genius resides in them, in every cell of their being. We're merely a facilitator to putting a force into that system that says, oh, I could be more of me. And poof, magic occurs. Thank you, folks. Good luck. I hope to be out in Barcelona again soon. Thank you. We'll see you soon. I hope. And if you come to the States, come and visit, please. Thank you. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Bye. Thank you. Well, Peter, it was like, wow. I loved it. It was amazing. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay, everybody. So take care, everybody. Um, on Friday, we are going to have Jérôme Poupel and uh, Russell Brown with us. So take care, okay. enjoy, and uh, see you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.